Hi, and welcome to this explainer video of Stocks for Beginners with Deep Knowledge Investing. And I'm talking today to the CEO and founder of Deep Knowledge Investing, Gary Broad. Hello, Gary. Hey, Phil. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for coming on. So the point of this video is to provide some information for prospective subscribers to your service about what they can expect from Deep Knowledge Investing, your experience, how it can be help people to become better investors. So let's start with a little bit of a background, uh, the origin story, Gary. Where did you come from and how did you turn to what you call the good side? Yeah. So my first job out of school was uh, in the mergers and acquisitions department of Morgan Stanley. You know, two-year analyst program, we were working 80 to 100 hours a week, super intense, but really phenomenal training. They did a great job of teaching us to understand companies and the financial statements and model them out. And you just did it again and again and again. And after my two years there was done, uh, a few people from different departments had invited me to stay on for a third year, but I really wanted to go work on the buy side. I'm much more interested in finding ways to make money rather than representing you know, somebody else's interests. And so then I spent a good 30 years on the buy side working for and running different hedge funds, I was with Doug Hirsch at Smith Newcourt, and he brought me with him when he started Seneca Capital. I worked for a number of other you know, really large, successful funds. I did event-driven special situations investing, merger arbitrage, long-short equity, growth investing, value investing. We really covered a lot of different things. And then I spent uh, eight years working with Raji Kabaz. We started Silver Arrow Investment Management together. And in our eight years, our long return on invested capital beat the S&P 500 by almost 100 percentage points. We almost doubled the index and the index was up. So we did really well. We turned out great returns for people. We created a lot of alpha, which is just a fancy way of saying we beat the market. And then, you know, when we shut that down at the end of 2019, I decided to start deep knowledge investing. And what I did was I took this same methodology that we used at Silver Arrow to turn out phenomenal market beating returns. And I made it available to everyone. And rather than just run a hedge fund for you know, fund of funds or only wealthy people, and we do, we, you know, I work with billion dollar hedge funds now. I work with very large uh, wealthy family offices now, but we also are available to people who might have, you know, as little as 10 or $20,000 in a Schwab account or an E-Trade account or a Robinhood account. And our goal is just to help people earn better returns in the stock market with less risk. And I started the firm January 1, 2020, and we have done that successfully. Anyone who's been with us for any length of time has made money, and I'm really proud about that and, and excited about it. It sounds like you've done the hard yards beforehand so that um, ordinary investors don't have to. Yeah, that's very much the case. You know, what we do, it's it's difficult and it's stressful and and that's okay. It should be because it's also interesting and you know, it can be lucrative if you do it well. And I'm happy with the risk reward, but there's something really amazing about working with people in the way that I get to now. And in fact, I had an incredible experience last week. One of our long-term subscribers, a great guy named David from Denmark, had sent me an email saying, I'd really like more explanation on this particular issue. And we've added a lot of new subscribers lately. I was getting similar questions from people. And I said, okay, hang on. I'm going to do a whole post about it. And, you know, turned that out yesterday, wrote a lengthy post explaining to people my views on, you know, what positions were current, what I owned, my exposures, how I was heavily invested and heavily hedged at the same time, my view on cash. And started getting this amazing feedback from existing subscribers saying, hey, this is really helpful. Thank you. And that's incredibly rewarding. The week before, I got a couple of emails from subscribers saying, I invested with you on this name or this stock, and I made money, and I'm in a better position now. And that's that's really exciting when I find out that people, their financial lives are just a little bit more secure because they work with deep knowledge investing. Those are great phone calls and great emails and, you know, I love getting them. It's it's a great thing to have someone like yourself holding an investor's hand 
to explain what you're thinking. And you're looking at things from a, you know, very much a very macro level that have the, the big forces on the economy all the way down to the deep research that you do on particular companies. And for me, it's great to be reading that and uh, feel like I'm actually getting some very solid insights. Thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. You know, I think we work with people really in four different ways. One is for people who they just want to make more money, but they're not interested in doing the work themselves. You know, if, if you go to the Deep Knowledge Investing website, the paid subscribers have access to a page called Current Recommendations. And, you know, right there, I have all the tickers, everything that I own in the portfolio. And if they want, they can just take the tickers. For those, at most of our people are not, and it's fine. For people who like that, that's great. You know, not everybody has to spend all day looking at stocks and they hire people like me to ensure they don't have to do that. And that's a totally fine, reasonable thing to do. I find that most of our subscribers are really interested in investing. So the second thing we do is we explain. If you go to the current recommendations page and it says, you know, I like a particular company, you click on that and it takes you to my report on it. And you can read and look and say, okay, do I agree with Carrie? Do I disagree? And that's fine too. You know, people are welcome to say, hey, I really like this. I'm going to put money in it or to say, it's not my kind of idea or I don't like those companies. And that's totally fine, but at least they know what I'm thinking. The third way we help is I write a lot on the macro landscape. I think it's really important for people to understand what's going on and particularly the last few years where the Federal Reserve has driven stock prices much more than individual company results. And so in those situations, you know, people have a good understanding or I give them a good understanding of what's going on and you know with the Federal Reserve with interest rates, inflation. I for a year we were taking apart the GDP numbers and the CPI numbers, so gross domestic product and the consumer price index and explaining where I thought the government was inaccurate and giving them a what I consider to be a much more nuanced accurate view. And explaining it to people, literally showing them the calculations. And then the final thing that we do is a certain amount of investor education. Sometimes I get basic questions from people, and that's great too. You know, how how do you view this? How do you look at this? And those are totally valid questions. And we'll often help people just understand how I think about investing and write posts about this is how I'm thinking about hedging the book. This is why I think this is an interesting idea. This is how you win here and don't lose there. And we'll walk them through that, uh, usually in writing, but you know, I'm, certainly we do phone calls and podcasts and webinars, you know, like just like I do with you. Well, that's why I'm so feel so privileged to have you on as a semi regular guest on Stocks for Beginners because you do take some of these very complex topics and then you explain them in such a way that ordinary folks like myself can understand it. So thank you very much for that. You know, I appreciate it. I, one of the things that I realized, so, you know, as an example, one place where I'm not good, I'm not a good marketer. And sometimes I talk to marketing people and, and you know, I'll say, hey, how do I do this? And to me, their explanation kind of sounds like, well, you know, you just go do the thing. No, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I haven't spent the last 30 years learning about marketing. I need a description, right? And, you know, your listeners, my subscribers, they're smart people but they haven't spent three decades, you know, investing 12, 13, 15 hours a day. And that's all right. You know, it's there. They have every right to want a reasonable, detailed, understandable explanation that doesn't require you to be a hedge fund manager. They want to be spoken to in plain English as opposed to, you know, finance speak. And so one of the things that I will often do when I'm on a podcast or even in writing is I'll use the the hedge fund jargon, the the financial the words that we use, but then explain it. You know, we'll, we'll use a term and say, okay, that's just a fancy way of saying this. Because people don't like being spoken to in a way that's confusing to them. Why somebody's asking you for information, why make it hard for them? You should make it easy for them. So the positions that you recommend, you own yourself, don't you? Always, always. You know, it's kind of funny. I remember when I first started the firm, I would talk to people. And I would get, you know, these very suspicious sounding, you know, they say, wait, do you own these positions? Kind of like, like I'd done something wrong. And my response is always like to smile and say, you better believe I do. That's right. If I think it's good enough for your portfolio, if I'm telling you, you should put your capital to work there, you better believe I own it. I would never recommend a, a stock or a position 
for somebody where I wasn't willing to put my own capital at work. And you know what I tell my subscribers is if we make money or lose money, whatever it is, you know that if it's on the Deep Knowledge Investing Current Recommendations page, I own it. And if that changes, if I sell something, you know, they're alerted immediately. I tell them right away. And sometimes I even tell them before I sell something. You know, there have been times I've said, when this stock hits a certain price, I'm going to sell it, you know, or I'm going to sell a certain percentage of it. And there, you know, there are things up on the the blog right now where I've said to people, when the following conditions occur, this will be my course of action. And then when I do it, I'll say, hey, I did what I told you I was going to do. Is it fair to say it's finding out what to buy, when to buy, and when to sell? Yeah, I think the two things that are really important. One is to be able to do the research, right? Every stock has a story, but not every story is correct, right? The the market is often wrong, and that's why you see so much volatility. And what we look for are situations where the market, where the dominant narrative, the thing that everybody knows to be true, and they've all agreed on it, is not actually correct. And where you really make a lot of money are the ones where you say, okay, everybody thinks X. Here's why X is wrong. All right. And once everybody realizes that it's not X, it's something different, is the stock going to go up or down? Those are the situations where you make a lot of money, where you find everybody else believing something that's not correct. Those are the things that we look for. And then, you know, the key thing is, figuring out when to exit. And, you know, the thing that I tell people, because I often talk about my ideas in public and I, you know, at one time I had somebody say, wait a minute, you, you talked about your ideas in public. Why would I pay? Why would I subscribe? My answer is great. When are you going to sell it? Right. If, if that stock is down 20%, do you buy more? Do you sell the position? What do you do? Right. Why is it down? Is everybody right? Are they wrong? Is there a problem? Is there an issue? Did something at the company change? Is there a misperception? I mean, you know, we once had a stock go down because an analyst, a sell side analyst, misunderstood a complicated aspect of something that was changing at the company. And he put out a report that was wrong. And and that's okay, right? I mean, it's he was working under pressure. He had time pressure, had to run it through compliance. It was complicated. And he just got it wrong. But that incorrect point of view out in public caused the stock to go down. We bought more. We bought more of it on news that was just incorrect, you know, but what if that analyst had been right? What if there really was a problem? What if his misperception of the situation had been real? We would have been selling the stock. And that's more than anything else. The thing that we provide for subscribers is not just the stock pick. It's knowing what to do after you own it. How is risk management handled by deck knowledge investing? So... That's a great question, Phil. And at the end of the day, we are not a hedge fund. This is not a limited partnership. People will trade their own position. So, you know, Phil, you're you're a subscriber. If I recommend a certain position, you have the choice. Do I want to buy it? Do I want to wait? Do I want to not do it? You know, sit and do nothing. Th- those are all your choices. But what I try to do, I try to do two things. I try to give people a sense of upside and downside right? How risky is this position? And is the upside worth the risk that we're taking? And there have been times that I've said to people, hey, I own this, don't make it big, right? It's like, it's good, but there's downside here. And you know, I have one position right now. I keep telling my subscribers, I keep this tiny because there are a lot of ways it could not work. And you don't want to take huge losses. So we do that on a position by position basis, telling people, hey, this is a great position. You know, we did that with Houghton Mifflin. We were buying that at foreign change. It got sold for $21 13 months later. Right. And we were buying it all the way out. We were buying it at at four, five, six, nine, ten. You know, even the day before it got bought out, I was telling people buy it at 18 because the risk reward was that good. Other things I'm telling people keep it very small because it might not work. The other thing that we do is we try to give people a sense of the overall market. And what I mean by that is, you know, one way I put deep knowledge investing on the map early on is, you know, we launched in January of 2020 
in late February of 2020, ahead of all the COVID lockdowns, which you know you guys certainly experience in Australia, we shorted the market. I, we, I had short positions, I quit options on the S and P 500. I mean, it was everything was shorting the market. And then you know when that was done, we just turned around and bought the recovery trade, and took off all the hedges and just went ultra long. You know, we told people to short the market the first week of January of 2022 ahead of the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. It was the right thing to do. When I see a lot of risk, and I I think right now there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that could go wrong that are not incorporated in the market view. They're not incorporated in pricing. You know, we just increase our hedging and I tell people, and there are all different ways to hedge. So right now we're layered in a whole bunch of ways. I'm hedging market risk by shorting the S&P 500, by shorting the NASDAQ, QQQ is the ticker. But I also own a huge energy portfolio, which is a great place to be in case of inflation. And we also have, you know, volatility hedges. It's kind of funny. I actually I actually wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. Because I saw your recommendation about that uh, volatility index ETF. Yeah. And um, I actually bought a small position of that because it, it makes sense and it's a, an easy way to profit from the market dropping down because when you talk about shorting, and that sounds like you know some strange Wall Street hoodoo, but an ordinary investor can just buy a volatility index ETF yeah. and experience the same ups, upside from a downside. That's exactly it. And here's the really- With a, with a very small position, by the way. <laughs> yes, good. Keep that one small. But you're you're exactly right. And here's the weird, quirky thing about Wall Street. Like the market isn't always right about this stuff. So for example, volatility is described as a large amount of price change up, down. The, that's how volatility is calculated. It's calculated by changes. But nobody really cares about upwards volatility, right? It's actually downwards volatility the stock price is going down, that makes the vol indexes rise. And so they should be symmetrical, meaning upside and downside moves in stock prices should have the same effect on the volatility pricing, but it doesn't. And in one sense, it's incorrect. In another sense, it actually makes sense. So, you know, let's let's talk about this in a way that will make sense to people who aren't buried in financial mathematics all day, right? When you buy insurance on your house, when you buy insurance on your car, you don't buy that insurance worried that the housing prices will go up and the value of your house will double. You don't buy it thinking, you know, what if my car becomes a collectible and the value of my car doubles, right? You, you buy insurance in case things go down. So it is a mathematically incorrect, but completely understandable quirk. And if you know that, and you understand how these things work, there are ways to take advantage of it. The, the advantage of doing this stuff for a really long time, you start to see the places where things might be wrong, but they still make sense. You can make money off of that. You know, other things that we've done is we have huge positions at uncorrelated assets. Sounds fancy, right? It's just a fancy way of saying we own things like energy, gold, silver, Bitcoin. And, you know, any reasonable person would say, wait, you think Bitcoin's uncorrelated? Look look at how it's moved the last two years. It's been an amplified version of the NASDAQ. And that's true. But long term, it's not correlated. Long term, that's not what it is. It's just moved with the index for, you know, reasons that do make sense for the last couple of years. But, you know, when you own that, in my case, I'm taking a bet against fiat currency. Again, it's just a fancy way of saying currency issued by a government that's not backed by anything, right? I, you know, the US dollar used to be backed by gold. And that took a hit uh, back in the early 1900s with the establishment of the Federal Reserve. And then it took another hit in 1971 when President Nixon took us off the gold standard. Now, you know, people say, oh, the dollars, it's hard currency. And yeah, it is the best fiat currency in the world. But Phil, what's it backed by? Faith and credit, right? Okay, great. So- Trading money. Yeah, right. F- faith is not a reason to invest. And credit, you know, the United States has $33 trillion of on balance sheet debt and roughly $200 trillion of off balance sheet debt, things like pensions, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. So the credit's not so good right now. And th- that's why we own things like Bitcoin or the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, GBTC. 
And so when you're asking me, like, how do I think about risk control? One of the things that made me crazy last year, uh, I think it was June of last year, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, came out and said, yeah, you know, I think we're heading for a hurricane or maybe a tropical storm or a shower. He was about as accurate as every meteorologist and roughly seven months late. Like, Jamie, the market's already been hammered on higher interest rates. Where have you been? But the thing that he didn't do, he told people, you know, this is potentially a problem. Well, great. You're right, but you're seven months late. But he had no plan. You know, with deep knowledge investing, we do not do that to people. If I say to you, hey, Phil, I'm worried about the market. Okay, great. What do we do? Okay, here's how we handle this. We can short this. We can buy this. We can buy puts here. We can buy volatility indexes. We can buy uncorrelated things like gold or Bitcoin. There are dozens and dozens of tools at our disposal to help people either protect their portfolio from downside risk, or in many cases, in what people refer to as bad markets, we say, yeah, there are no good or bad markets, right? We can make money in all markets. Don't complain. How do we make money? And you know that again, this is what we did in February of 2020. We loaded up on short positions and then the market went down 33%. Last year we were loaded with short positions and you know, stock and bond indexes were down 30% at one point. So there are lots of things that can be done in what people refer to as a bad market. There are lots of ways to control risk. The one thing that I never, never, never do to people is I, I never say to them, things are bad. Okay, thanks. Good talking to you. Right? That's <laughs> that's not helpful. Right? People yeah. like, okay, the next words out of your mouth need to be, so this is what we're doing to either mitigate that risk or at times make money at times when everyone else is losing. That's what we're focused on. I don't have any patience for people who say, oh, it's a bad market. If you need the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates at zero and have a nine trillion dollar balance sheet with you know unlimited quantitative easing infinity to make money, then you know you're not a stock picker. You can be replaced by people who just buy indexes and hold them. So our job is to help people make money in all markets. Right. Well, let's uh, move on to a bit of a screen share so we can see. Yeah. Um, what? potential subscribers will find when they go to deep knowledge investing. Um, how about we just quickly, what have you got up first? Uh, so we've got the the homepage here and, you know, you can see I, I, I do a lot of media, which is great. You know, I love talking to people about ideas and, you know, being in Barron's or on Real Vision uh, has been phenomenal or doing your podcast is always terrific. And then, you know, we explain to people how we help them. What do we do? Why someone should subscribe? How we help people? You know, we try to give them a really good explanation. And, you know, here's somebody who's made a lot of money from, you know, stock recommendations. And it's great to get those emails. And then, you know, the core of what we do is really the blog where I'm explaining and writing to people what we're doing. Again, there are a lot of places where we've made just huge amounts of money for people and had stock picks that have doubled, tripled, quadrupled. And that's great. And, you know, I can't promise that that will always happen. That's hard to do, but we've been in the right place multiple times and, and that's a plus. We also are really well advised. And the. Yeah, I was going to ask about the board of advisors. There, there seems to be so many people. Uh, are these. How are they involved with deep knowledge investing? The board of advisors at this point is about 20 people who are just exceptional subject matter experts. And, you know, I, I talk to them all the time, uh, you know, just just on the screen here, you know, Chris Bell is the national sales manager for Horizon Kinetics and knows an enormous amount about both energy and Bitcoin. And those two are much more correlated than, than many people think. Peter Costa you know, family office guy. He was on the board of governors of the New York Stock Exchange. Wendy Diamond is actually a, a pet and Bitcoin expert. Dr. Somi Ichimpade was the uh, head of the ICU at New York Presbyterian. Phenomenal physician, surgeon. Howard Friedland is both a real estate and spirits expert. Jason Galui, fascinating person. He was a uh, lieutenant colonel in the United States Army, served in combat conditions in both Iraq and Afghanistan, was an economics professor at West Point, was on the West Point hockey team. And then he was 
a special military advisor in the Oval Office to President Obama and followed that by being a special economic advisor to President Trump in the Oval Office. You know, the Obama and Trump administrations, those Venn diagrams do not overlap a lot. But, you know, Jason is phenomenal. And what he knows about leadership is just remarkable. Heather Heldman was a member of the Obama State Department. She worked at The Hague and then started her own international political risk consulting firm, Lumina. Her knowledge of China, the Middle East, Russia is unparalleled. She's phenomenal. Uh, Joe Jarabek worked in the Bush White House, the uh, George W. Bush. When I call him and I want to know if certain legislation has legs, if it's going to pass or not, he has been right 100% of the time. You know, plenty of times he said, yeah, this is going to happen or just, nope, not a possibility. John Genrette is a phenomenal real estate operator. He's a great multifamily housing person. It's also terrific in the family office space. You remember the old Wall Street firm, Donaldson, Lufkin, Genrette? That Genrette. And uh, just one of the finest people I know. Phil Kessler is an incredible attorney. He has argued cases up through the United States Supreme Court. A couple of years ago, we made a ton of money in HCA, the hospital company, because there was a case in front of the Supreme Court that affected them. And Phil has had dinner with almost every member of the United States Supreme Court. And so he was able to say, okay, this is how this justice thinks. This is how this justice decides things. Like having that kind of insight on the board and understanding you know, not only what the court should do, but what individual members of the court will do because of their view of the world is is really amazing. Raji Kabaz was, you know, my partner at Silver Arrow. The two of us have shared an investment brain for more than a decade. He's one of the finest investors I know. And, uh, you know, to this day, Raji and I are still on the phone, you know, 10 times a week talking about investing in the markets. And we've had um, we've had Raji on the, the podcast talking about his uh, educational in- initiatives for high school students as well, which he's um, founding and undertaking at the moment. Yeah, he's mm. incredible. Howard J. Klein is a 30-year C-level uh, gaming executive. He's worked for almost every major casino company in the world. So, you know, I, I think gaming is a, a phenomenal business. Being able to talk to Howard about that is really incredible. His His industry expertise is unparalleled in that space. Michael Kliegman ran a division of the IRS. He's currently senior counsel at Aiken Gump. When it comes to uh, tax and accounting issues, he has been right 100% of the time. John Krebsky is phenomenal in the field of decision making and marketing. I have seen him in four hours do what McKinsey takes six months to do and millions of dollars. Just really an incredible mind, an original thinker, a systematic thinker. Jim Leach heads up the oldest family office in the state of Rhode Island. He's a phenomenal real estate investor, knows everyone everywhere. He's just a terrific family office person. Dr. John Lanchowski, one of the most fascinating people I know, he was President Reagan's national security advisor on the Soviet Union. When the United States won the Cold War, he was one of the people who came up with the strategy to do that. And he now started basically his own university, the Institute for World Politics, where they prepare young people for careers in statecraft. Uh, The faculty there is top notch and they're economics people. They're fans of the Austrian school, not the Keynesian nonsense that we see now, like really just incredible place to get an education, incredible person to learn from. It's terrible, isn't it? How a few people even understand the idea that there is another school of thought in economic theory apart from Keynes. And I don't think people even know who Jane, John Maynard Keynes was, yeah. um, but the it seems to be the tenets of that style of economics is what most politicians ascribe or subscribe to as opposed to a bit more of a dry and dusty but sensible Austrian economic plan. Yeah, that's 100% right. And I've had the opportunity to do a couple of webinars with Dr. David Glancy at the Institute for World Politics. And, you know, in many cases, most academic economists are not particularly useful when it comes to understanding markets and making money. Hmm. Dr. Glancy is the exception. Dr. Lenchowski has has put together a phenomenal team there. And I, just having the opportunity to talk to someone who is in the room with President Reagan during the Cold War. For the people listening to this, understanding 
what's happening in Russia is uh, very useful in terms of understanding the markets right now. There are, you know, current events that matter. His knowledge of the situations is is just amazing. Kit McArthur is an entrepreneur and an energy expert. He knows a ton about clean energy. He started multiple energy trading firms, actually lives very close to me here in Westport. Terrific person, great investment mind. Eric Mulheim was in my class at Morgan Stanley. I've known him for more than 30 years. He has worked as the CFO of multiple companies. He actually was the founder of Disney English and helped Disney start an entire business in China teaching English to people there online. He was early on the whole online education space. Lawrence O is one of the best strategists I know and an incredible attorney. In 22 years as a Brooklyn assistant district attorney, he never lost a case. You know, try to imagine going into a place where so many people despise the police and winning every case. And remember, if you're a prosecutor, you have to go 11 and 0 to win. You need to convince all 11 members of the jury to do what you want. He's incredible. Uh, and really just an amazing strategist. Tito Pombra is great on the compliance side, you know, for better or worse, that's the world we live in. And he's been incredibly effective at making sure that we are, you know, buttoned up on anything on the regulatory side. Mish is the only economist who goes by a mononym. You know, he's like Cher or Madonna. <laughs> you know, he's a star in the economic space. I have read his work for maybe 15 years, something like that. Just really smart when it comes to economics, politics. The two of us, you know, we'll get on a webinar or a Twitter space to talk about ideas. There's a 100% guarantee the two of us are running long. Tony Saxton, uh, incredible on it in the field of commercially viable, environmentally friendly energy. Just his company, Terra Group, I'm, I'm a strategic advisor to them. They're doing incredible things. Everything they're doing is eco-friendly, but they're not relying on government subsidies for anything. And Dr. Paul Thompson is probably the country's best exercise cardiologist. He was regularly a guest on Good Morning America to talk to people about heart health and how exercise affects that. He's an incredible physician. And one of the reasons I love having him on the board is he'll call me and say, hey, you know, there's this new drug or this new technology or this new medical device. And so I'll do research calls and get him on the phone and he'll be texting me questions while I'm asking the questions. So I'm, you know, I'm doing an expert call with somebody and he's listening in and texting me, ask this, follow up on that. Uh, and then the two of us discuss it. He's been incredible in terms of coming up with some really good money-making ideas. And he's also just one of the nicest human beings I know. It really is a remarkable group of people and I'm lucky to have every one of them, Phil. I mean, to me, it sounds like there is so much heft behind what deep knowledge investing is offering as evidenced by this group on the the, uh, the board of advisors. Yeah, there's there's a lot of weight to the firm. There are a lot of people who are just incredible subject matter experts and having access to them and having their input is is really amazing. And, you know, it's it's fun the way they comment and things like I remember at one point we bought a really profitable position in Las Vegas Sands Gaming. And Somi, the surgeon, contacted me, called to say, hey, I want to talk to you about this. He, he wanted to discuss it, but he's, you know, he's a phenomenal investor himself. He used to work for Stevie Cohen at 0.72 on the biotech side. Yeah. So um, let's take a look into the members only section <laughs> because this is not what's available to the general populace. Yeah. So, you know, some of these are like, Yesterday, I put out a lengthy portfolio update. Sorry, this was the short one that two days ago, I put out a lengthy portfolio update explaining to people the size of my positions and everything, how I was hedging, what I was doing with cash. That was the post we were talking about. We had a, a short one on energy yesterday. Certain things I put in public, we do a weekly piece, five things to know. This was an interesting piece talking about investing and you know how do you know you're wrong in a position and again you know it, i went through case studies there were situations where you know we sold something very quickly and protected profits to it there were others or you know situations where we got it wrong and had to sell and take a loss 
And then we also gave an example, digital realty, where the stock got hammered after we bought it because people misunderstood and we just kept buying it on the way down. And when it doubled, we owned a huge position in it and made huge profits because we were willing to be patient and keep adding as the stock came down. And that that was a great place to be. You know, we cover a lot of ground. Like so, sometimes people were, Barron's was talking about legislation and credit cards. And, uh, you know, I I just thought people had the wrong view on that. And we don't have positions in the space, but sometimes you explaining to people what's happening in the markets, that has its own value as well. The portfolio updates, those are the ones where I'm buying and selling something. And, you know, we keep that strictly for paying subscribers because that's what they're paying for. They, you know, they deserve to have that that relationship respected. And every now and then, we we don't do this often, but sometimes we get great guest posts for people from people. And uh, you know, I'm always happy to feature great work being done by others. Deep knowledge investing does not have to be the Gary Broad show. You know, we we collaborate, we work with people, we highlight other people's terrific work. In fact, I did that today. This post here it contains a link to a terrific piece by Gary Mashurius. You know, he, he's not a competitor, he's a collaborator, and we'd much rather work with people than not. And by the way, Phil, you know, just if in case people are wondering to get a sense of the depth, right? Like this is one page. We've got 41 pages of posts here. You know, sometimes I write often, sometimes less often, but always when I feel like I have a point of view that's not properly reflected in the Wall Street Journal or on CNBC. And uh, you're very active. I think it's your socials are mainly LinkedIn and Twitter. And so people can also just start following you as well to get a sense um, of what's being offered by Deep Knowledge Investing. Yeah. Uh, Twitter, I, I, I do post on LinkedIn. Twitter is probably the, the best way to follow me. It's at Gary underscore Broad, B-R-O-D-E. But yeah, I'm, you know, I'm on there talking to people all the time. One of the things I love about the FinTwit community, financial Twitter, is there are a lot of really smart, knowledgeable people. And it really is. It's not a, yeah, people think Twitter is about, you know, arguing about politics or telling people. Toxicity. Like, hey, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, you know, sure. There are corners of Twitter like that, but most of us in the FinTwit community, we're talking to each other. We're having conversations, we're having discussions, debates, we're sharing information. You know, the best thing to do if somebody has a post that you think is interesting on Twitter, put a comment in there. Like, you know, I'm curious, ask them a question. You know, you'd be mm. amazed at how quickly people will respond, even people with really large followings. You know, the people like to share information and there may be debates. We might not agree with each other all the time, but it's rarely toxic. We're, we're very collaborative there. Mm. So, Deep Knowledge Investing is offering listeners, now viewers of uh, this podcast, um, a special deal. Tell us a bit about that. Sure. Our you know regular rates, we charge individual subscribers $50 a month or $200 for six months. But for your listeners, Phil, you know, we have a, a coupon code for them that will get them 50% off of their first subscription. So, you know, if you know it's something you're interested in, you can subscribe for six months for $100. Or, you know, if you're really not sure and just want to dip your toe in, you know, you can check it out for a month for $25. And, you know, we're happy to have them. And what we found is that people have been renewing. So I think they're getting value from it. And, you know, if you do that, we hope you'll decide to stick around. That would be terrific. But, you know, it's I understand people who don't know me or don't know what we're doing, they want to check it out at a discount. And that's a totally reasonable thing to do. We're happy to have. Them. And that promo code, is, of course, is stocks to beginners 50. Right. So stocks for beginners and the 550 is it's the number five zero. Uh it's fifty percent off. And by the way, guys, don't just, don't feel just badly. Like, the, like the cheap print spruik as we are. Yeah. No, but you know, the people shouldn't feel badly for no. taking advantage of that. I understand that. I understand why they want to check it out and you know, feel free make use of the the discount code, come in at a discount. You know, even one time we had somebody who subscribed. And I knew they'd come in, you know, through one of our affiliate links and because they'd put the coupon code in a note and they didn't put it in the right place. And we caught it. They they paid full price because the, the coupon code was in a note and we caught it and we just said, OK, hey, you know, you didn't do this right. Don't worry. We're revising your order so that you get the discount. And, you know, we, we gave them an extended discount because, you know, it's 
I want people to be around for a long time, right? We're not, we're not doing it for the $25 or the $50 or the $100. Because investing is for the long term. You can't just do it for a week or two and expect to make um, big bucks. It's just going to be something in the process that you undertake for a longer period of time. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, we have had this year, we've had two things where people have made like, you know, 40% returns in two months. And that's great when you get those, those little one-offs, right? This chance to buy a, a short-term option or something where there's a catalyst. But I always tell people, don't count on that, right? What, where I see those opportunities, great. I will point them out and you can, you know, in those moments, make enough money in two months to cover your cost of the subscription for years and years to come. But, you know, the real heart of what we do is long-term investing. And I'm not trading the portfolio regularly. I'm in things because I think we're going to make a lot of money in them over a two, three, five-year period. And I think that's really the best way to approach investing. And that's what I do with my money. And, you know, so part of what we do is put people in good positions and counsel patients. But, you know, that said, when things are changing, we do react quickly. And when the market changes, we may keep the position, but hedge against what people consider to be a bad market. You know, I, I don't think it's a bad market. It's just a chance to make money in a different way. Well, I'm just hoping that viewers and listeners can uh, get a good, uh, much better understanding of um, deep knowledge investing after watching this. Gary Broad, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Phil. Great speaking with you as always.